you know we have Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve Eve services coming up. We are praying for every seat on every campus to be filled. And I want us to be sure that we are praying that people will be responsive to the good news of Jesus Christ this Christmas Eve as we share it. And also, I just want to share with you that we um, have had a great year as a church financially. Uh, for the last couple of months, though, um, uh, our giving has not been on track with what we had hoped. And um, I want to ask you to pray that God's people will step forward in generosity and we'll be able to finish this year strong. So pray with me. Father, I do pray for those that you will bring here on Christmas Eve and the Christmas Eve Eve service. I pray, Father, that they would have open hearts to you and to the gift that is ours in Jesus. And I pray, Father, that, that people will actually make the life-changing decision to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. And Father, I thank you that this church is a generous church. I know that you will always take care of your people and the needs that, um, that we have as a church body. And I pray, God, you would please um, bless us as we move to the end of the year financially, that people will continue to be generous and step up so that we might finish strong. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in a message series called The Gift, because Jesus is the best gift at Christmas time. And we are taking as our theme really a verse that you find in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet, 720 years before Jesus was born, looked forward into history and he saw who Jesus would be. And it is a, a passage that we hear a lot at this time of year. It's in Isaiah 9, 6, and he goes like this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And early Christians, when they read this verse, they said, this must be about Jesus because it describes who he is. So we started this series two weeks ago when we talked about Jesus being the wonderful counselor. And then last week we talked about how he is mighty God. Anybody want to guess what we're going to talk about this week? The everlasting father. Now, when Isaiah wrote this, there was not a word that meant everlasting father. So Isaiah invented a word. He took the Hebrew word for father, ab, and then he took the word ad and put them together so it became ab, ad. Ad is a preposition and it means unto. So basically, literally, Isaiah is saying, you have a father unto, unto what? He's saying, as far as you can think, into eternity, you have a father, and it is Jesus. Now, this is a little strange to us because we're used to thinking about God the Father, Jesus the Son, but because Jesus and our Heavenly Father are the same being existing as two different persons, and you add the Holy Spirit, that's the third person, Jesus is also our Heavenly Father. Now, when the disciples read this, what made them think that Jesus was a heavenly father? Because they looked at him and they realized that he was exactly who our God in heaven was. Now, fathers in Jesus' day were considered to be the authority of the family. They were considered to be the source of all values, and this is still true. The father sets the tone for the values of the family. This is not anti-feminist. It simply describes a reality. I had a counselor friend tell me when my daughters were 10 and 14 that the number one determinant of who my daughters would marry would be how they saw me. That was frightening. I decided I'd better up my game as a dad. And so my daughters are both married now. And I think they've chosen well. And if those boys ever step out of line. <laughs> okay, uh, they, I did a survey in Switzerland and they found out if mom and dad attend church together with the kids, there's a 33% chance the kids will attend church regularly as adults and actually a 41% chance that they'll attend irregularly. But if dad does not attend, only mom takes the kids to church, 
only 2% chance that the kids will attend regularly. A 37% chance that they'll attend irregularly. So basically you've got a swing of 30% of whether kids will even be involved in church depending on whether dad goes to church or not. See, dads still set the values. And that's what the disciples saw, that Jesus would be the dad of this new movement, this movement that we call Christianity or the church, that Jesus would be the everlasting father who would see the church all the way into eternity and he would set the standard for what it meant to live, how to live in this new kingdom. When the disciples saw Jesus, they saw their heavenly father. Now we're gonna look at a passage today in the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible, turn to John chapter eight. John chapter eight, this is part of a lengthy discussion that goes on, it actually starts in John chapter seven. There's an argument between Jesus and the Jewish religious leaders and scholars. And we're gonna drop in at the end of the argument in verse 48. In this long argument, the scholars and leaders are not listening to Jesus. They are entrenched, they are stubborn, they have made up their mind, they're not listening. Have you ever been the person who doesn't listen? Let me change the question. Have you ever been a teenager? Okay, a couple of you still there, right? I, I got it. And so mom comes in to talk to you about something but you are really engrossed in your phone or doing something else or back in my day, you were watching something on TV and, and, and your mom says, are you even listening to me? Now, you are never honest in reply. True? Because what do you say? Of course I'm listening to you. And she says, what did I just say? Well, I was listening, <laughs> but you sounded kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wop, 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 right? Okay, so you've all experienced this, and this is the situation between Jesus and these Jewish leaders. Now, the argument has not gone well for the Jewish leaders, so they have resorted to name-calling. This is where we pick it up in verse 48. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? That's name-calling. To be called a Samaritan was to be called a half-breed. There are other words now we would use for that. Samaritans only believed the first five books of the Old Testament, so they were thought to teach only part of the truth. They're saying, Jesus, you don't even teach the whole truth. And besides that, you're demon-possessed. You, you, you act like somebody that Satan has taken control of. You're not even following God. Today, we would call that being prejudiced or profiling. Now, before you make up your mind about Jesus, give him a chance. You see, they're not doing that. They're, they are not giving Jesus a chance. Their minds are made up. I, I was talking with a man a few years ago about Jesus, and he said, you know, it's all a myth. Yeah, I think Jesus existed, but he didn't really come back from the dead, and he didn't do all those miracles. It's all a myth. And I said, well, that's interesting. Why do you say that? And he said, I saw this show on the Discovery Channel. And I said, well, that's interesting. I want you to do this. Instead of just trusting a show on the Discovery Channel, how about reading the gospel for yourself? And if you're not certain about Jesus and certain about who he is, how about investigating it for yourself? Read the gospels. Read the New Testament. Do your homework. Read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I think you'll find there's more than adequate proof that Jesus is who he said he was. Now Jesus replied, and there's so much here. Jesus replied in verse 49, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and, I dis and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Okay, what's Jesus say? First thing he says is, I'm not possessed by a demon. Am I acting like a crazy person? 
You see, Jesus knew how demons acted when they possessed a person. Jesus said, I'm not acting like that. Notice how he doesn't even pay attention to the racial slur about the Samaritans. And then he says, I honor my father. What does the word honor mean? It means to give weight, to give priority, to take someone seriously. To honor someone means you recognize their authority, their expertise, and their guidance. My cousin Ned knows more about orange groves than anybody else I know. And so if Ned rides by, rides by the orange groves that we own down in Florida, and he calls me and he says, Clay, your, your trees are looking a little droopy. I think you need to water them. What do I do? I, I, I say, well, Ned, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm all the way up here in South Carolina. I've got a better feel for those groves than you do. Do you think I say that? No, because I'm not stupid. Instead, as soon as Ned tells me that, because I honor Ned's words, I hang up the phone, I call the foreman, I say, turn on the pumps. We've got a water. Now, here's my question to you. Who are you honoring? Or whose words have authority in your life? I see most people will give authority to three sources. They will give authority to their friends. We call it peer pressure. They'll give authority to other pseudo-authorities. In other words, they watch Dr. Phil for the answer to all of their problems. Or they will give authority to themselves. They will trust themselves. And you see inherently the difficulty with all of that. We are not infallible, we're not perfect. Our friends are not perfect. And just because someone has a platform, a blog, a uh, an X account does not mean that they're an authority in your life. Jesus is saying, I honor my heavenly father. I give his words priority. Are you honoring your heavenly father? Do you recognize that Jesus knows more about your life than you do, more than your friends do, more than, than anyone else? Now, what Jesus says next is harsh. You dishonor me. But he's really just telling the truth. You're not taking my word seriously. You're not even listening to me. How are the Jewish leaders and scholars dishonoring Jesus? They are more committed to their ideas about Jesus than they are to the truth about Jesus. And they have already made up their minds that this man is a threat to their way of belief, their way of living. They are, as we say, hard-headed. I, I went to an ear, nose, and throat doctor once, and he did a CAT scan of my brain. And uh, he came back and he said, has anybody ever told you that you have an ab abnormally thick skull? I said, several times, as a matter of fact. And apparently that is one of the gifts that God has given me. I have a thick skull. Now here's the funny part. I was planning on using this story and this guy shows up in the last service sitting on the second row listening to me tell this story and he is rolling on the floor laughing as I'm telling it. Maybe it's even thicker than I think. That's these people. They have made up their minds. And Jesus has to be blunt and direct and drive home his point. And so he goes on and he says, look, I'm not seeking honor and glory for myself. I'm not about trying to promote myself or prove to you who I am. He is comfortable with who God, has, who he is, with who he is in God. God's not self-promoting. He doesn't have to be. Have you ever noticed it's always the insecure people who have to promote themselves? It's always the insecure people who have to tell you how smart they are. It's always the insecure people who have to show you how powerful or how many followers they have. We don't talk much about Jesus' humility. But isn't it true that to come to earth be born and placed in a manger requires great humility. 
Isn't it true that all through his life, Jesus avoided the spotlight? So to be like Jesus means we walk in humility. We we are not trying to prove that we are somebody. We can be secure in who we are in him. Now, Jesus does say this cryptic thing. He says, there is one who seeks and judges. Jesus is talking about his heavenly father. And he is reminding us that our heavenly father is paying attention to every one of us. Some of us look for strategic windows when we think God is not paying attention. Those windows don't exist. There are seven and a half billion people on the planet. I want you to get a feeling for the vastness of God. God is aware of every person living. He knows what you are thinking. He knows how you are acting. He knows what you are repressing. And his brain is not taxed by that overload of information. I don't even know myself what I'm thinking sometimes. And I sure have a hard time trying to figure out what my spouse thinks and my kids think. And yet God is able to track it all. So he is seeking. And then, and then there's this cryptic phrase, he is judging. Now remember, when we talk about God is judge, that means we have to remember God is merciful. He is incorruptible. He is fair. He's truthful. When God judges, he simply is telling us the truth about ourselves. So what would God's judgment be of you right now? What would God's judgment of you be right now? Now there's one more thing in this section. Jesus says, the one who keeps or does or guards my word, they're they're not going to see death. Now, does this mean a follower of Jesus never dies? No. What it means is if you are a follower of Jesus, death changes. It is no longer something you view as the end. Now you see death as fulfillment. You see death as part of following Jesus. And you have followed Jesus here on earth, and now you are going to follow him into eternity. You are passing through a doorway. Years ago, I was talking with a woman who had a terminal disease and she was nearing the end of her life. And I was visiting with her. I asked her, are you afraid to die? And she looked at me in surprise and said, why should I be afraid to die? I'm going to see Jesus. And I thought, good point. Why did I ask the question? So don't miss this. Don't miss this. You know, if, if you're really not comfortable following Jesus here on earth, what makes you think you're going to be comfortable in heaven? But for those of us who actually keep his word, for those of us who actually take Jesus seriously, who honor, who give weight to his word, who understand that Jesus has authority, for us, death is going to be different. It's a continuation of the journey we've already started. Now, the reaction of the Jews, they're still not listening. Verse 52, at this they proclaimed or exclaimed, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Have you ever heard of confirmation bias? Confirmation bias is when you have made up your mind and then you only listen to information that supports your position. You only listen to the people who agree with you. And that's what the Jewish leaders and scholars are doing. They're saying, look, 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 look. (laughs) you really are demon possessed. You're talking crazy. You know, Abraham died, the prophets died, and you're saying your followers won't die? Who do you think you are? Now, again, I've said this repeatedly through this series. I'm glad I'm not Jesus because if I were Jesus, I would call 10,000 angels and have them sing part 
of the Messiah by Handel. You may remember this part. And I would have them sing, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But I would have so much sound, it would blow the hair off their heads. In Jesus' name. Jesus does not do that, remember? And look what he says in verse 54. Jesus replied, I glorify, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. Let me pause right there. It's so important we understand this. People who have to be the center of attention, they're not being like Jesus. People who have to present themselves as the know-it-all are not being like Jesus. People who feel like they're the ones who have to have all the answers, they're not being like Jesus. Jesus says, look, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Jesus is saying, look, I count on my heavenly father to glorify me. I am not counting on, on, on myself. Jesus never saw the spotlight, sought the spotlight. I have a pastor friend who, who said to me that he felt like his job got a lot easier when he stopped listening for the approval of everyone leaving the worship center. And instead, at the end of the Sunday morning, he would get in his car and say, well, Heavenly Father, how did I do today? Do you approve? That's the way Jesus lived. He was counting on his Heavenly Father to glorify him, to, to give him weight and status. How, how, how would it, different would your life be if you lived it in such a way that God's approval was the only approval that mattered, who would you stop trying to please? What spotlight would you stop chasing? Now Jesus again speaks bluntly. He says, you do not know my father. He uses here the Greek word gnosis or gnosis, which means intellectual understanding. Jesus is saying, you have the wrong idea about my heavenly father, therefore you have the wrong idea about me. How you think about God matters. Don't think you can just delegate that job out to someone else. Now this is important. I know far too many people who claim to be followers of Christ who delegate the job of thinking about God to someone else. And so they, they find a preacher, they admire, nothing wrong with that. But just remember, he's a preacher, he's a man, he's got faults, he's got flaws. And, and, and I know people who will say, well, I really like listening to, to this guy, I like listening to this study, I like reading this guy. You guys know, I, if I don't quote Dallas Willard once every two weeks, I'm just not preaching well. But you've got to do the work yourself. You've got to think, understand, put together your own framework of who God is. For example, if you primarily focus on God as judge, you think that's going to change the way you relate to him? I mean, does anybody go up to a judge and be vulnerable? So yesterday I was working at my, my little pasture that I have here and all of a sudden I, I, I smell some smoke and there's a fire across the road. Sumter County Fire Department comes, puts it out in the woods and then they're blocking my, my gate and I, I kind of go to talk to them, say, can you move the truck? And I say, how'd the fire start? And they said, we don't know. And then they laughed. And I said, why are you laughing? He said, well, we asked the people who are playing in the woods how the fire started and they say they don't know, it just, they, they turned their back and all of a sudden there was a fire. It's a miracle. You see, if, if you're afraid of God, you're not gonna tell God the truth. You're not gonna confess your sins. You may even deny that you're a sinner. 
Jesus says, but I actually do know God. And he uses a different word for knowledge. He uses the Greek word oda, which means awareness. Jesus is saying, look, you, you may have an intellectual understanding of God, but I actually am aware of God. I am experiencing God. I walk with our heavenly Father. Did you know you can do this? You can live your life in such a way so that you are constantly aware of our heavenly Father. There was a great missionary in the Philippines, a man named Frank Laubach. And Frank, and this is the age before electronic watches, he took a dot of red paint and put it right at the 12 on his watch. So every time he looked at his watch, he saw that red dot and he thought, I need to pray. I need to think about God. A friend of mine sent an alarm on his phone that went off every hour just to remind him to be aware of God's presence. You can do this. You know why Jesus does this? Because the Jewish leaders and scholars have been lying to themselves. And that's what he says. He said, if I said I didn't know God, I'd be a liar just like you. By the way, don't be surprised that Jesus can be confrontive. He's confrontive because he wants you to know the truth. I don't think the Jewish leaders and scholars woke up every morning, looked at themselves in the mirror, and said, you know, I think I'll lie to myself today. I find that we lie to ourselves in two frames. The first is, is the immediate lie. The immediate lie goes something like this. You know, I've been good today. And a candy bar won't hurt me. Anybody ever tell themselves this lie? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> But there's another kind of lie, and it's a more insidious lie. It is what happens when over time we let ourselves be captured by a way of thinking about God that is flawed and wrong. And that's why Jesus says they're liars. They have lost sight of the truth. That's why you and I need to regularly pray Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, a prayer of examine. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, God, I am not smart enough to know myself. Help me know myself and know the truth about myself. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? What would happen if you did? And then Jesus finishes by saying, hey, Abraham knew about me, and he was looking forward. He rejoiced in the day that I would come. Now, remember, Abraham lives 2,000 years before Jesus. And somehow God revealed to Abraham that, look, I am beginning with you, and we're going to do something amazing. You're going to be the father of many nations. Hey, but by the way, Abraham, one day in this wrecked and wretched world, there is going to be a Savior who is born. You are his ancestor. And now the Jews respond one last time. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you've seen Abraham? Yeah, you're, all, you're not even 50. And, and that happened 2,000 years ago, Jesus. Have y'all ever heard the old country saying he's touched, touched in the head? You know that old country saying? It means, means that the elevator doesn't rise quite to the top, that your bread is not quite done that you are one nugget short of a happy meal? Do you, do you know what that means? That's what the Jews are thinking. He's saying he's touched, he's touched in the head. You know, who do you think you are? You, you, you're not even 50. And you, who you say you've seen Abraham? And what Jesus says next is one of his most audacious claims in the gospels. And it is his, his claim to be the everlasting father. In verse 58, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple crowns. Notice what Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. He does not say I was, 
but I am. In this, he is claiming to be God. Because remember, God exists outside the parameters of time. This is so hard for us to get. Remember, time is dependent on gravity. It is dependent on orbit, on universe dynamics. And Jesus is saying, look, before there was any time, before there was matter, before there was a big bang, before I said, let there be light, I existed. Jesus is saying, I am eternal being without beginning or end. And then Jesus goes on, and when he says, I am, it so infuriated the Jews, they wanted to stone him. Why? Because they knew their Bible. They knew in Exodus 3, 14, God said something very profound to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And the Jews understood, I am is God's name. And when Jesus says, I am, they understood what he was claiming and they were furious and they were ready to stone him for blasphemy. And so we go back to our original question. What made the disciples think that Jesus was the everlasting father? Because it made sense. They had been told that God was all about keeping rules, but Jesus introduced them to a God who was merciful and forgiving, and they saw Jesus die on a cross for their sins, and they saw him resurrected. They saw Jesus doing things that only a heavenly father could do, and they made the connection that Jesus was not just a rabbi or a teacher. He was indeed God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God come to be with us. He is, I am, the everlasting father. And so if you want to know God, Know Jesus. Investigate him. Read the Gospels. Follow him. This is, may sound weird to you. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, try to do what he says for, for a month. See if it works. Be open enough to see if his way works. You find it will. You'll find it will. And maybe today, some of you, you do need to accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord and I hope you will. This is a picture of a woman named Tori Peterson. Tori grew up in a foster care system. It was not a good experience for her. Um, She absorbed a message that she was worthless, and her peers would poke fun at her, saying that she had daddy issues. And so, like a lot of young women uh, who get abused, She began to look for love in all the wrong places, and she often thought, if I could just have a father, it would solve my problems. Thankfully, in her late adolescence, Tori became acquainted with some friends who asked her to go to church, and she did, and she began to hear a different picture of God than she'd ever heard before. She began to see how God was gracious in the lives of the people around her. She began to see Christians actually sacrifice for her. And Tori said, my salvation did not happen in a single grand moment, but through small miracles that gradually chipped away at the scales of skepticism. And she began to believe that what Jesus said about her was more important than what she had done or what had been done to her. And I want you to hear her words. In the end, the father I'd always wanted turned out to be the father who was always there. The father who revealed himself to me in his own perfect timing. Today, Jesus is revealing himself to you. He is the everlasting Father. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that Jesus is our everlasting Father, that when we look at him, we see you. 
thank you for his revealing himself to us as our Savior and our Lord, our leader, our Father who sets the values. And I pray for all of us who claim to follow Jesus that today we will get a clearer picture of what that looks like and honor Jesus' words and do what he says. I pray for those who have not yet accepted Jesus as Savior that today they would take that next step toward him and embrace him as Savior and Lord. Now, Father, would you speak to all of us in his name?